Okay. <clears throat> so, um, everybody, thank you so much for joining us. This is really exciting. Um, I'm here with Marco and with Rachel Roberts. Um, and Rachel is going to be talking about the Homeopathy Research Institute, the latest news, what they're up to. Um, my name is Anna, and uh, Radar Opus is putting on this program for all of you. Um, if you have any questions, please feel free to comment in the comment box or uh, write a question, and I'll make sure that that gets um, asked by Rachel at some point in the presentation. Um, but we're all so happy that you're here and joining us. This is a collaboration um, between you know, us and all of the homeopaths in the world. So we're very excited that Rachel is here and can um, share the latest news with us. Thank you. Uh, just wanted to say thank you, really, on behalf of uh, Radar Opus, uh, Rachel, for allowing us to disturb you on a Sunday afternoon, your time. And, uh, yeah, really, again, thanks, everyone, for joining uh, this great webinar. So uh, here you go. Great. Thank you. Oh, thanks so much for having me. I do think that anybody who has joined today deserves extra credit from the universe for actually attending something like this on a Sunday. I think that's pretty cool. Um, and I am very aware that even though HRI has pretty much taken over my life, there are still some people around the world who don't totally understand what we do or know what we're all about. So it's, it's really lovely to have the opportunity to talk to you today and explain a little bit about our work. Um, some people know a little bit because they've seen just one drop. Um, but this is a chance to really sort of show you what HRI is doing. So um, HRI is a UK registered charity and the work we do pretty much comes into three different streams. Um, we want to promote new high quality research in homeopathy. Uh, we want to communicate the research, that's uh, quite a challenge at the moment as I'm sure you're aware to communicate the research in an accurate and objective way. So we see a lot of misinformation about homeopathy research. HRI is always about providing accurate and objective information. And then, of course, we want to also train homeopaths in research skills for the future, because if we don't have new researchers coming through the system, then who's going to do the research for us in future years? The charity was created by Alex Tournier, who I think some of you now know. Um, and the most important things to know about Alex's background is that he's first and foremost a physicist. He trained at London, Cambridge, Heidelberg, all these very prestigious institutions. And he has a background both in traditional sort of classical physics as well as theoretical physics and quantum theory. So it's really a gift to homeopathy that he got interested in homeopathy at a crucial time in his career. So he decided to then train as a homeopath. So he had that combination of classical physics training and homeopathy training so that he could do the research. And he spent over 11 years at Cancer Research UK in London, which is one of the most highly esteemed research institutes in Europe. So he really has fantastic credentials. Uh, I joined Alex on this adventure about two years into the um, development of the charity, and I kind of come from the opposite side of things. So I have uh, what I would call some solid uh, scientific and research uh, background in terms of biological sciences degree, specializing in physiology um, that I did way back at the University of Birmingham. But I actually went into homeopathy as my first career, which is quite unusual in the UK. So that meant I went into uh, homeopathy instead of doing my PhD when I was about 22 um, and I've been in it ever since so uh, it's about over 25 years now in this sector so between us we have quite a good combination of science and he, he's focusing on the fundamental and basic research I know more about clinical research I bring more as a homeopath and practitioner and teacher and between us we run the HRI so in terms of the rest of our charity structure, of course, we have a very strong board of directors. But in terms of the scientific output we do, we're absolutely delighted that we have this amazing scientific advisory committee, which is pretty much, you might not know these names, but we're lucky enough to have a sort of who's who of the basic and fundamental research, as well as the clinical research from around the world. And in terms of our development, we have been around for almost 10 years. 
Um, we started funding our first research project back in 2010. That was Stephen Cartwright, if any of you know his work, on ultra-high dilutions using basically some dyes that help you tell whether something is just water or a homeopathic medicine. And we launched publicly at the House of Commons in 2011. And some of you might recognize that date. In 2011, that's when there was a parliamentary report published in the UK that was very negative about homeopathy. And this is where we kind of decided how we wanted HRI to be in the future. We saw this report come out. It was scientifically terrible. I mean, it's not even a scientific document, but it had a huge impact. So we said, right then, we will launch our charity in the same building, right in their faces. And we did this huge event uh, for the media, for scientists, for doctors, for homeopaths, for journalists. And we said, look, we need to research this. And this is what we've created this charity to do. So we wanted to be front and center countering these kind of attacks each time they come along. 2012, we started funding Philippa Fibert for her PhD. She just got that last year. And then we took another step in 2013. That's when we started doing our international research conferences, which are a really huge part of what we do and extremely important for stimulating the homeopathy research world um, globally, really. We also started consultancy work. That's something that Nobody really knows much about because, of course, it's kind of um, behind the scenes. But ever since uh, 2013, uh, various organizations around the world, if they're having a specific issue where they need scientific expertise and they don't have them in-house, they will contact HRI and say, we have this problem. We need a scientist. Could you help us out? And that first example was with the Society of Homeopaths, which is the biggest uh, register of homeopaths in Europe and they had some problems with the Advertising Standards Authority challenging what um, the society was saying on its website, what our members were saying on their websites in advertising and so on. Um, and we, it was all about the evidence base. It's all about what claims we could make, what claims we couldn't make. And uh, they asked me to help with that and deal with that challenge, which took about two years, actually. But uh, we mostly won that one, which was quite satisfying. So in terms of the research that HRI does ourselves, the research that we promote, we fund, we carry out ourselves, um, this is targeting three different areas. How do homeopathic medicines work? What can it treat or not? And how can we learn more from the evidence that already exists? In terms of clinical research, because we're such a small charity, we have limited funding, we really have to make every trial count. So we are very careful about the strategy we use for where we sort of deploy our resources. And when it comes to clinical research, we're really looking at effectiveness gap conditions. So what we mean by that is conditions for which conventional medicine doesn't really have all the answers. And we really would like to find a better way forward in treatment. One of the studies we've done is on depression. This was Petter Vixfeen, who did a pragmatic RCT at the University of Sheffield, got his PhD through doing this work. And it was fantastic because this is really looking at what we might call real homeopathy. So this is individualized, delivered by fully trained practitioners, given the right amount of time with the patients and so on. And crucially, this is where you compare one group that is just being treated by normal conventional medicine against a second group that gets usual care plus homeopathy because we know that's how it is in the real world people are not choosing between them they are usually adding homeopathy onto their healthcare regime that they're already receiving from their medical doctors and it was great to see that come out positive he found a moderate treatment effect to the homeopathy which is actually a very good result for those of you that might not know moderate is actually very good we have a very similar trial going on at the moment. Uh, Philippa Fibert has got her PhD last year, but her trial is actually ongoing. Uh, same trial design, same supervisor, also University of Sheffield. And after six months with this trial, she's done some data collection at that point of what her results are. And again, it's looking like this medium or moderate clinical effect, which is really encouraging. So we've got the same style of homeopathy, the same trial design, getting the same uh, level of result for the patients. So it's looking like a nice, consistent, positive result for homeopathy. When it comes to 
finding out how homeopathy works that is a much bigger project um, as you can imagine that's kind of the holy grail a lot of people um, would really really like to know how the pills work other people don't care as long as it works they don't care how it works for some people i have to say like myself the scientist in me would still like to know how the little white pills actually do the job that we know they can do so this is our flagship fundamental research project it's the water research lab in heidelberg germany and this is headed up by Alex, who has now left cancer research and decided to devote his time entirely to the water research lab. And then one day a week where he still helps out with HRI. And he has a fabulous researcher working with him, Dr. Everin van der Kratz, who is a specialist in water research. And what, one of the many things I love about this project um, is that it is called the water research lab for a reason because it is pure physics of water that they are looking at. And that will have all sorts of ramifications for healthcare in the future, not just homeopathy. I mean, it is really pretty groundbreaking research. It just so happens that all the work they're doing would inevitably tell us how homeopathy works along the way. So it's not a homeopathic lab, it's a water research lab. And that means quite a lot to me because I do believe in pure science. In terms of our remit to communicate the research accurately and objectively, I think everybody on this call knows what a challenge that is in this day and age. Um, and when I first came into HRI, there was a very, very basic website. And I remember saying to Alex, I really want to create something new. Because at that point, the only research online was just kind of cobbled together you know, you just click on somewhere and there'd be this whole list of studies and it didn't really mean anything. It's like, yay, we've got thousands of studies, but it didn't tell you whether they were good or bad or rubbish or positive or negative or anything. I mean, it was meaningless. So I thought I want there to be one place anyone in the world can go to and you know that everything on that site has been treble checked. You know it's good or it wouldn't be there. You know it's relevant or it wouldn't be there and you can trust it. But also, the ultimate challenge, I wanted it to be rigorous enough that any scientist looking at it can see that we know what we're talking about and it's robust. But I wanted anyone to be able to understand it who is vaguely intelligent, but no, not necessarily having scientific training. So it has to work for what people call the layperson, even though I don't really like that expression, for members of the public, I prefer to say. So it was quite a challenge making it work for scientists and the public, but I hope that's what we've achieved. For example, one of the resources on the HRI website that we are most proud of is the Core Hom database. And if you haven't come across this, it's extremely important because you'll see there we've acknowledged the Karsten Stiftung. Stiftung is German for foundation. And the Karstens Foundation is the world leader in creating databases on this topic. And we knew about their databases, but we knew that they weren't very user friendly, to be honest. The scientific quality was fantastic, but they were very clunky to use. They weren't really accessible to people who didn't speak German very well. So we collaborated with them for a couple of years and we developed their sort of front end for their database and we worked on the data with them so now if you go onto this for free it is the best most up-to-date database in the world with over 1200 clinical studies in it everything from case studies through to full-blown trials and you can put a you can browse it or you can put say hay fever in there click a button and there's all the studies that exist on hay fever and if you click on it it will tell you was it peer-reviewed was it not was it placebo control or not? What's the quality like if we know and so on? So it's a really strong resource. The other end of the spectrum, this is our most commonly visited section of our website by far. It's the homeopathy FAQs. And this was really my attempt to counter the bad press that homeopathy gets. And again, I'm sure you are very familiar with that. Um, we all know that the other side, should we call them, I don't like calling them skeptics because to me, skepticism is healthy, being skeptical, but people do call them skeptics. Um, for years, the way they were uh, making ground against homeopathy was by repeating the same mantras over and over and very simple. There's no evidence. It doesn't work. It's placebo and so on. So I wanted 
scientifically robust answers to those points. And I know they're not actually questions, they're statements, but this website has to work for people all over the world. So FAQs, most people know what an FAQ is, and it seems to be working. We had requests to translate this into over 16 languages. We actually agreed to 10, which are there now. They're all live in 10 languages. And I've drawn the line there because we just won't be able to maintain them um, if we do any more. Um, but it is nice to see that there's that level of interest. And I've been assured by people that they are being used, as I hoped, by everybody from members of the public to homeopaths to patients to CEOs of homeopathic companies in meetings all over the world. And I feel like there's a real strength in all of us using the same answers. I'm not saying they're perfect. Uh, you might have one you prefer, but I know they're robust for sure, and I know they're accurate. And if all of us use the same ones over and over again, of course, there's a chance that that will break through the psyche of some people more than if we're all saying different things. When people say there is no research, drives me mad. <laughs> um, another strategy we've tried is to film researchers talking about their own work. Because if you're saying there's no research, it's much harder for someone to believe that when they can hear the researchers themselves. They can see them and they can hear the passion in their voices and how articulate and intelligent they are. And of course, um, it's quite strange for you to see Peter here, our beloved friend who we lost, sadly. Um, but we feel like we want to keep Peter part of this because he was one of the very important supporters of Alex when he set up HRI nearly 10 years ago. Dr. Liz Thompson and Dr. Peter Fisher were two of the people who helped Alex get this off the ground. So we want to keep him part of it. As I said, our conferences are a big output from our charity. We do them every two years. We started in Barcelona, then Rome, then Malta. And all of the presentations done at all of our conferences are free to view online permanently. So you just have to Google HRI Rome or HRI Malta or so on, and they will all come up free to view. Our next conference, I will tell you a bit more about at the end, but we're extremely excited. I'm getting quite excited now. It's only 10 weeks away. and Yes, it's our fourth conference, but it's also our 10th birthday. So that's why we decided to bring our conference home to London for the first time. And also with all the attacks that have happened in the UK recently and the you know, NHS not paying for prescriptions anymore, all of this ridiculous um, goings on here, we thought, you know what, it's time to bring it home and do our conference right in London, right under the nose of people who say there's no science and invite them to come along. So you keep saying there's no science, come and hear it for yourselves. So, um, yeah, I do encourage anyone who has an interest to come along to that celebration. And the reason we've picked the Tower of London as our main promotional shot here is because on the Saturday night, uh, we are actually having a gala dinner and a fundraising gala in the Tower of London. So um, and I know Marco's going to be there and I'm just trying to make sure that he behaves himself. <laughs> He's on his best behavior. It is the Tower of London. I'm making promises. <laughs> it's a royal palace. So, you know, we, we need to be on our best behavior. So. In terms of our day-to-day -day work, um, of course, we are sought out repeatedly when people need expert input about the science. And on a most sort of very basic day-to-day -day level, that might be something as simple as being part of the Four Homeopathy Coalition in the UK. Uh, we're very proud of that coalition. That's now 11 organisations. It's the whole sector working together from colleges to pharmacies to charities we all work together and of course hri has been part of that from day one and then more recently um even something like the samueli institute in the states that had a, a meeting of people from all over the world to think about improving strategies for homeopathy in the future i was delighted to be part of that project this is the most boring slide I think I've ever written. <laughs> I do not expect you to read it all. Um, it's just to remind people, I suppose, that one of the day-to-day -day tasks we often have is entering into public consultations. Um, sometimes these are sort of defensive. You can see the FDA in the middle there. Um, you know, you feel like perhaps homeopathy is being challenged in some way or there might be a threat of some kind. So we're asked to talk about the evidence base. Other times, it's quite proactive. Um, antimicrobial resistance, we know, is a big problem globally. So people are looking for new ideas of what might be future treatments instead of antibiotics. So that was a purely positive move 
We just wanted the UK Parliament to know about the evidence that supports homeopathy for that kind of work. And then, of course, we do get roped in for very specific threats. Um, I'm sure Liz Thompson, I've asked her, she doesn't mind me talking about this, the kind of thing most people don't know that we do. Um, you might know Liz Thompson as the doctor who was in charge of the Bristol Homeopathic Hospital for years. She then uh, wanted to split off and set up her own uh, hospital service, the Portland Centre for Integrated Medicine, that has now become the National Centre for Integrated Medicine, which is very exciting. But back in 2014, when she was trying to get that initiative off the ground, she had a particular meeting and she rang me up and said, Rachel, I've got this meeting. Basically, if I do not convince this particular committee not to believe everything they've heard about the evidence base so far, you know, there's no evidence, it's placebo, etc. If they do not change their mind, it's gone. The whole thing is over. And I was saying, well, Liz, when's your meeting? And she said, day after tomorrow. <laughs> okay. So she asked me to do this document for her to take to this meeting. So I dropped everything, did this thing for her, and thank God it worked. And it continued. And now, you know, years on, everything's happened. So this is the kind of thing where people get in touch at critical times, really, and sometimes just need that little bit of help to keep things moving. So if we're thinking about threats, I think we're all aware that the biggest threat to homeopathy is actually the bashing it gets in the media. And we know that all that bashing is really coming from one major threat. And that is the Australian report that was published back in March 2015. So in terms of what HRI has been doing recently, um, Believe it or not, something we started looking at in 2015 is still one of our biggest projects by far. And for me personally, it probably is my biggest ongoing project. This report came out and it generated these devastating headlines all around the world. And they did two media pushes, one in 2015, one in 2016. And the headlines were pretty devastating. Some of you will already know, if you've seen just one drop in particular, that's where we really were able to get the message out about this report. Um, but if you haven't heard of it before, the Australian report was conducted by the National Healthcare, no, the National Health and Medical Research Council, I should know that by now, NHMRC. All you need to know about NHMRC is it is a, it's recognised worldwide as one of the leaders in conducting evidence reviews and it's a government research institute. So they have amazing credibility. And they produced this 600-page document, which supposedly summarized 57 systematic reviews on 61 conditions. And then they boiled that down into a 40-page document aimed at the general public. And their conclusion was that there are no health conditions to which there is reliable evidence homeopathy is effective. And homeopathy should not be used to treat health conditions that are chronic, serious, or could become serious. So again, pretty devastating. When we looked at that, we were obviously shocked because we know it cannot be accurate because we know the data and we know what they should have found. So when we started digging into it, we realized that the key word in their conclusion is reliable. If you're saying there's no reliable evidence, what do you mean by the word reliable? So we looked that up. And what the public were told is that a reliable trial had to be good quality, well-designed, and with enough participants for a meaningful result, which I think you will agree sounds absolutely reasonable. The problem is, when you dug deeper into that report, only then could you find out what they meant by that. And that's where we uncovered this minimum 150 participants and a quality score of five out of five on this famous quality scale, the JADAD scale. And that's what they meant by reliable. If a trial failed either of those, either it had fewer people in it or its quality score was less than five out of five, they just said it's unreliable and they completely dismissed the findings. Now, just one more thing to say on that actually is there's been a lot of confusion around this, even though we sort of dug this out uh, and communicated it via things like the Just One Drop film. People have been saying that they excluded all the trials that didn't meet this standard, they didn't technically exclude them. So what happens is if you go to that 600 page document, they're all there. So it looks fine. Oh, there they all are. All of these uh, trials, 176 of them. 
The problem is, if you say that most of them are unreliable, the data disappears from the results. So it was a really cunning plan to look like they did the research properly, but in fact, they didn't. And even though there are many, many things wrong with the actual report that they published, the biggest thing to communicate today, just in case it hasn't crossed your radar, was that the NHMRC carried out the review twice. Now, when I discovered this, I was in shock. Uh, this was something that Jerry Dendrinos in Australia, who I've been collaborating with, he unearthed this only by doing freedom of information requests, you know, where you can ask an organization to share internal documents like emails and minutes from meetings. And he suddenly found they were talking about some other report way back in 2012. So we discover this first review that was done by a different contractor in a different institute for the NHMRC. They sort of outsourced it and they got this report. So when we asked NHMRC about this first report, they said, oh, uh, we terminated the contract because there was a problem with the quality. There was something wrong with the report. That does not sound correct when you find out that, first of all, the person who wrote it was an expert at doing these reviews. who would written, I think it's about 80 publications. She's highly experienced. And then the really gold piece of evidence we found was when Jerry uncovered, again, through this FOI, Freedom of Information, he found an email from Professor Fred Mendelssohn, who I've been assured by people who know him, is a very well-respected, honest scientist. And he was the one that checked the quality for NHMRC. And he said he was impressed, was rigorous, thorough, great approach. It was unbiased. It was convincing. I mean, this is a kind of five-star review of a piece of science. So that really does suggest that NHMRC may not be being totally honest when they say they binned this because of quality reasons. So what's been done about this? Um, Jerry Dendrinos in Australia from the Australian Homeopathic Association, he contacted us back in February 2016 and asked us whether we would co-author this challenge to the Commonwealth Ombudsman, which is the only legal challenge open um, to when you want to criticise a document of this kind. And you're able to do this because NHMRC are a government institute. So because the, it's taxpayers' money that has paid for this report, then the ombudsman is supposed to be a completely objective, independent person who can challenge the government and say, did something wrong happen here with this particular report? So we co-wrote that. It took us six months. Um, ended up being 300 pages long, 62 pages of which was the scientific analysis. And that was done by myself, my number two on this, Dr. Angelina Mosley, who's a superb scientist. She did all the data extraction and analysis. So all the numbers that you see, like in just one drop, that came from her digging through the report and getting the numbers for us. And of course, Alex was involved as well. He was brilliant at checking our work as we went through. We'd send it over to him and he could check whether we were making sense uh, and whether we were making any mistakes. So it was a great team effort with the three of us. And Jerry did all the procedural breaches, bias, conflict of interest. And we've had a fabulous lawyer holding our hand all the way through. We had our last call about a week ago. Um, who is making sure that we have the best possible uh, legal input. So if you want to know more about this for any reason, we have a dedicated section of our website on this that it's very obvious how to get there from the home page. So we have a main page that's got the whole story, hopefully dumbed down into very easy language for anyone to follow. And then we have a newer page, which we put up about a year into the process, um, where we started, as you can imagine, getting lots of inquiries from around the world, people, if you like, on our side and also on the other side of the debate. So we gathered up all of those questions until we felt like we were clear on where people needed more information. And we put together this second page, the Australian Report FAQs. So if there's any question that isn't answered on the first page, just click on the link to go through to this second page. And this is sort of more technical information for people who need it. Um, if you still can't find an answer, then, of course, get in touch with us. But what we find is that for most people, if they have a question, one of those two pages will answer it for them. We've also, on that section of the website, provided resources that we think 
people might need for slightly different um, actions they might want to take about this. We know that the whole homeopathic community is pretty annoyed about this totally inaccurate report. So there are people all over the world wanting to be vocal about this and wanting to challenge it. So on our site, you'll find everything from press releases to key messages. There's a short clip of me talking about the science. There's a longer clip of me with more detail if you need to talk to a scientist. We've got quotes. We've got all sorts. In fact, we've even included the executive summary from the actual ombudsman complaint that we submitted back in 2016. So I don't know if you've heard some people trying to say there is no complaint. That's one of the myths that the skeptics have put all over the Internet, saying that HRI is making this up. There isn't a complaint at all. We're just... It's all smoke and mirrors. Obviously, that's not true. Uh, one of the fastest ways to prove that is that they can read the executive summary of what we sent in to the ombudsman. So I felt like I wanted to leave it with you to go to our website for detailed information about the Australian report because everybody wants a different amount of information, so I don't need to cover it here. But one thing I wanted to do, um, I love it. I can't remember which conference I was at, but somewhere, I think it might have been in Sydney uh, a few months ago, someone said to me, I know this is a hugely complex issue, which it is. It's why it needed a 62-page scientific analysis for the lawyer, you know. But she said, can you give me the dinner party version? And I knew exactly what she meant. You know, someone mentions this too. said, oh, I know homeopathy doesn't work because there's that report that came out of Australia from that really famous institute, and it said there's no evidence it works. So the dinner party version that I hope is easy enough for everybody to understand is that the NHMRC report cannot be trusted because they did it twice. And if you publish only the second attempt, then, you know, something very dodgy is going on. They use an unscientific method that had never been used before or since by any research group. So what I'm referring to there is this 150 rule and five out of five quality. That does not exist in any research done anywhere in the world on any topic. They invented those rules just for this homeopathy review. So it's extremely strange. Thirdly, the findings of high quality positive studies are missing from their results. And that's because they invented those rules. If you dismiss the findings of all the trials smaller than 150, and then you dismiss the findings of all the trials that had less than a perfect quality score, they reduced the data set from 176 studies to five studies. And as it happened, they judged those five studies to be negative. So if that's how you do it, then of course you're going to get a negative result. And of course, there are going to be high quality positive studies that are missing just because they had fewer than 150 people in them. So this is incredibly bad science. And because of all of that, in a nutshell, that Australian report seriously misleads the public. And of course, that is not OK when it's the taxpayer who has paid for that report. And that's why we have such a strong legal case, which is still ongoing. And we are waiting for the verdict. I keep looking at my phone. <laughs> Part of the reason is I know I could get a text at any time telling me the verdict is in. And I'm trying not to stress about that because it is out of my control now. But uh, we are literally anticipating result any day now. You might be aware of some of the global PR we've done around this issue. So, okay, yes, we had to do the Ombudsman complaint, which was a mammoth task, and it did take all those months of hard work, and we submitted that. And we've had to keep going with that whole official process ever since. You know, the Ombudsman asks for more information on something, then they go back to NHMRC, NHMRC argue it, they come back to us. And we've had this tennis match ever since. We've just gone into three years of this. And this tennis match has gone on for three years. So it's been an ongoing legal struggle. However, we were told from very early on by our lawyer, said, you know what, this is really difficult because what you're asking is for the ombudsman to find that an Australian government research institute has basically committed scientific fraud. This is incredibly serious. And that's going to be really tough for the ombudsman to do the honourable thing, because politically, that's terrible for Australia. NHMRC is like a jewel in the crown of their um, government. They're really, really proud of it. They do not want its reputation to be damaged. So the lawyer said, what you need to do is you need to do PR campaigns 
that make the public aware of this to such an extent that it's politically easier for the ombudsman to do the right thing. I mean, the case is clear. Legally, ethically, scientifically, it's very, very clear cut, but it's tough for them. So that's where why I started working with Laurel on Just One Drop. I mean, she interviewed me before the Australian thing happened, but when it happened, I told her about it because I said, actually, I think you need to know about this. And of course, she was happy to help because that film really did raise awareness of the Australian report for the first time. You might be aware of Your Health, Your Choice, which was also part of this campaign, carefully orchestrated, even though it is for the whole of complementary medicine. That campaign is about the public's right to choose conventional, conventional or complementary medicine of any kind. It's not just about homeopathy. We really wanted to reach as many people as we could. And so we used that platform, Your Health, Your Choice, to say, you know what, the public should have a right to choose the health care that they want to use. And part of that, for some people, is homeopathy. And that access to homeopathy is being threatened by this inaccurate report. And so we led people to learn about the Australian report. More recently, we launched the Release the First Report campaign, which hopefully the purpose of that is clear by now. It's all about that first buried report. We feel like the public has a right to see what answer NHMRC got the first time they did this scientific review. This is a very old slide. Uh, it's now over something like 75,000 signups. Um, but if you would like to add your voice to this whole issue before the verdict comes in, please do still log on to releasethefirstreport.com and sign up and help us really repeat this message to the world that this kind of inaccurate research cannot be allowed to stand. One of the biggest challenges we've had is explaining to the world why this matters. You know, someone said earlier, she's a homeopathy geek. I have turned into a homeopathy research geek. My entire life has become about homeopathy research. So the moment I picked up this report, I was terrified about what was going to happen because I know how convincing it looks. If I was a decision maker and I picked it up, I would believe it. You have to know the data intimately to see what they did and how they manipulated it and how they gave a false result. So I knew what we were up against. And the only way that we can destroy it is through this on Ombudsman challenge and educating people to say, this is bad science, you cannot trust it. So one of the things I've been trying to do with my little team over the last few years is track the specific impact of that report. I was sure it would have a global impact, but we needed to track and see if that's actually what was going on. So ever since it was published, we've reached out to our networks in over 100 countries and said to people, if you ever see it being used, to damage the sector, please tell us because we're trying to get, manage that information so that if and when we're lucky enough to get a positive result and get it taken down, we need to be able to go back to every decision maker who cancelled a course or uh, stopped patients accessing medicines or whatever they were trying to do and say, you need to reverse that decision because you based that decision on bad science. So we've done that work. We collated that data. And we were trying to decide the best way to, again, put that out to the world. So you should see it's on the home page of the HRI website still right now. We've produced this clip, which is only a couple of minutes long. And that tries, it's my best attempt with my little team, to communicate the impact of the Australian report. So if anybody wants to understand what this issue is about, just watch that clip. And, you know, the best test of whether something is good communication or not is to get someone who doesn't know too much about it to check it for you. And just before we went live, I asked um, the HRI bookkeeper, actually, if she could have a look at it because she knew a bit about it because she processes our receipts. So she knows all the countries I've been to in the last 18 months in particular, trying to put fires out that have been started by this report and she knows how much of my life that has taken up but she said it wasn't till she saw this clip that she finally got it she said and she did say oh my god rachel i had no idea what is at stake for homeopathy worldwide all because of this one document written in australia so really recommend you take a look at that clip so to come back to 
HRI who we are doing this work. Um, we've had one kind of problem, I suppose, that's been ongoing ever since I joined HRI back in something like 2010. And that is that people have thought we're much bigger than we are, um, which is kind of a homeopathic thing. We are a tiny charity doing all these huge projects, now working with people all over the world. And it's such an honor to do that work. And we love the fact that we have these colleagues all around the world that we're working with. But in terms of our actual core team at HRI, we are still tiny. We have never grown. All that's happened is the demands on our time have grown. So there's myself, I'm full-time. Uh, communications officer Chris is full-time. He joined September last year, so about 18 months ago. And then we have Simon, some of you who will you'll know him from our conferences three days a week. Angelina is my one academic support person. Um, she helps me with the scientific work one day a week. Um, she's actually just had her second baby in February, so I'm back on my own again for a while. But uh, as soon as she can manage it and comes back from maternity leave, she'll help me out again. And then Alex, of course, now he's doing the water research lab four, four days a week. He has one day a week available for HRI. So if you add everybody together at HRI, it's the equivalent of three full-time people. That is it. Of course, we use web people and so on, you know, bookkeepers, but our actual day-to-day -day team has never exceeded three people. People have come and gone and changed over the years, um, but it's always been three people. So it's really difficult sometimes when people say, you know, why hasn't HRI done this or that or done this faster or we're behind on something? I really want to scream, we need help. We need support. Um, in terms of our funding, it got to 2015, and we are so lucky to have a major patron, but we basically maxed out our major patron in 2015. He said to me and Alex, that's as far as I can go for you. I'll stay with you at this amount, but I can't go any further. And since 2015, the workload has just exploded, really, largely because of the Australian report. So we've basically been under more and more strain as a little team. And people are always saying, well, Rachel, how can we help? And another problem we've had is if I say, well, we really do need donations, that's the biggest help you can give HRI is a donation. People have, again, thought it's too big. You know, what you need is too big because we know research is expensive. We know that really you need a much bigger budget than you have right now, and it's too much. So they don't feel it's worth giving us anything. And, of course, what we've discovered is that's not the way to think because that's not how it really works. And I learned this lesson for myself in Hong Kong. And Marco was there when this happened. That I was feeling like, oh, we only really need major donors. Is it really worth people giving us smaller amounts? And I realized it is worth it because what happened there, which was a great surprise, it's back in July, I think. Um, I was giving a presentation and at the end, a student, she's just a homeopathy student, stood up and said, we have a surprise for you. And this group of students had been to the HRI conference in Malta a year before. And she said, we remembered you saying you needed money, you needed donations. So for a whole year, this group of students had quietly just put aside a little bit from every patient they saw in their student clinic and gathered it all together. And a year later, this girl stood up and gave me an envelope full of Hong Kong dollars. And I was completely overwhelmed. In fact, I, I think I cried, and I don't really do crying. I certainly don't do crying in public, and I really was. It took my breath away. It was absolutely amazing. Um, and it reminded me that a little bit by many people really does make a difference, and that helped me. That money helped me hugely for the next, I remember the next six weeks, I was getting help from some admin support that I couldn't have afforded, so it really does make a difference. So I really would ask if anyone thinks they can manage to give a little, then if all the homeopaths around the world who think HRI is doing a good job did that, we'd probably be in a much better situation. And I really wanted to draw your attention to some schemes because people here are listening from different countries, but I believe every country has an equivalent to the schemes I've got on my slide here, which are what we have in the UK. We have Give As You Live, Amazon Smile, eBay for Charity. These are all schemes where all you have to do is sign up, and every time you make a purchase or do your basically your normal online shopping, 
a small amount goes to HRI. You just nominate the charity that you want to give to, and every purchase generates a little bit of money. And it's amazing. Now, certainly in the UK, that can be booking holidays, flights, doing your grocery shopping online, almost anything and everything. And it's got all the main shops on there. All our big brand companies are on there. So I would ask if it's possible to look to see if there's anything like that where you live and nominate HRI as your charity, because then you can give to us and you literally don't have to pay for it even, it doesn't even come out of your pocket. So, you know, we really would appreciate that support. And while I'm thinking about more positive things in the future, I suppose I just wanted to finish off by saying that um, to me, the future is very bright. Uh, I know that might sound strange. I feel like homeopathy has never been under greater attack. But that's for a good reason. That is because we are getting stronger. And it's because we're suddenly being perceived as a threat that is worth attacking. Um, and the result of those attacks is that the homeopathy sector has done two things. I believe it's got stronger. It's actually improved in many, many ways because we've had this spotlight shone on us looking for any faults that can be exploited by our enemies, basically. And when you're under a spotlight, it's, you know, it's interesting what you see. And I think sometimes they had some legitimate points years back about certain things, certainly in the UK, that we could have been doing better. So we did do them better. We raised our own standards. We improved our education. We improved our regulation. We improved our communications. We improved everything. And we raised the bar for ourselves because we had to. So I want to thank the skeptics for that. You really helped us get our house in order. And now I feel prouder than ever of our sector and what we have to offer patients in terms of the both the medicines we offer and also the training we can offer to new people coming into the profession. It's never been better. So that to me is a positive. And the second positive is collaboration, which is why I thought of it when this slide came up, because we were a very fragmented sector in the UK back in sort of 2005, 2008. We were arguing <laughs> amongst ourselves most of the time, arguing about which was the right type of homeopathy, classical or practical, single prescribing, polypharmacy, you name it. Uh, should you have to be a doctor? Should you not have to be a doctor? We have these big political struggles going on. And it's amazing how when you are suddenly under attack and you think you might get wiped out, you can put aside problems you've had for years. And our sector in the UK, we have fully unified now. It's absolutely amazing. And we've done that through this collaboration known as 4 Homeopathy or 4H UK, which we're very proud to now see being picked up by other countries um, around the world. And just in terms of HRI itself, you know, we started off in the UK and then we started working with our colleagues across the sector in Europe. These logos, if you're not familiar with them, eChamp is a coalition of all the homeopathic manufacturers in Europe, or most of them, almost all of them. And we work also with the main two that aren't part of eChamp. We are working with all the manufacturers, which is just a pleasure. We're working with ECH that represents all the medical homeopaths at an EU level. And we're working with ECCH, which represents all the non-medics uh, across Europe. So that's the entire sector. And then in more recent years, thanks to the Australian report, and I did have to travel wherever there was a fire going on or wherever we really felt we needed more help and support, traveling around the world and realizing that um, there are colleagues all over the world who want to work with HRI, who believe in research, who see the value and the necessity of research ever since it's become central to the debate. And this means, of course, the Australians, but also LIGA, which is a global community. We've worked very closely with LIGA over the years. 4-H Canada has now just started. We have our friends in Hong Kong who are great supporters of HRI, and even CCRH in India. They hosted me for three weeks uh, last January, uh, about a year ago, um, and did a tour of India just to really learn about the Indian homeopathic community and, of course, all the strengths they have from their incredible homeopathic sector there. So I really feel like none of that would have happened if we hadn't been attacked. And thinking about people coming together and collaborating, of course, I would get shot by Simon 
if I didn't plug our own conference today, uh, he would be very unimpressed with me. So um, I have to mention, I think the most important thing to say about uh, HRI conferences is they are nothing like homeopathy conferences that you might have been to before. Um, first of all, it really is only about homeopathy research. It's, it's not homeopathy itself. And it is a scientific conference. So what I mean by that is for someone to present at our conference, they have to submit an abstract of their work, and it has to be peer-reviewed by a minimum of two experts. And if they disagree, it goes to a third expert and so on until we get a clear result. And from that, we select the program. So this time, we had over 130 abstracts submitted. They all got peer-reviewed. And we look at the scores, and then we boil it down to the ones that are high enough quality. And then we look at the relevance, and then we form a program. And that means that um, this time we've got 36 oral presentations, and we've got 50 posters. And again, if you're not familiar with uh, this kind of presentation of science, posters are a big deal. It's something that you do with uh, studies that are still in development. They're at a very early stage. Or if perhaps you're a student, PhD student, you're not very experienced, that's one of the first things you do is you present your work as a poster at a conference. And this year we've got around 50 five zero posters in a great big exhibition that we're doing. So that means that you're getting, uh, there is a bit of an overlap, but yeah, about 82 different researchers are coming from all over the world. We've got 82 researchers from 26 countries coming to present over two and a half days. So it's quite intense. Um, keynotes get half an hour to speak. Normal presenters get 15 minutes. <laughs> so you can imagine when we first started doing this style of conference back in 2013 in Barcelona for the first time, it was a shock for the homeopathy world. They really kind of didn't get it. And I had people sending me their PowerPoints saying, I need a minimum of two hours and um, this kind of thing. And I said, I'm sorry, it doesn't work like that. You have to submit and go through peer review. And if you're lucky, you will get 15 <laughs> minutes. So um, I'm sure Jeremy Sher wouldn't mind me saying, um, he was one of the people who chatted to me uh, just before 2013 conference and said, Rachel, I'm reading the information. Tell me how this works again. And of course, Jeremy, one of the most famous homeopaths in the world, known him for decades. And he said, so you're telling me I have to submit? I said, yes, you do, Jeremy. And you have to pass. I, you know, you do not get on the program because you're Jeremy Sher. You get on the program if it passes the scientific threshold. Um, and he did. So he did his 15 minutes. And quite a few people in Barcelona were laughing about the fact it was the first time they'd ever seen Jeremy Sher in a suit and tie. So I feel like it's worth watching his film purely for that. But, you know, he did a fantastic job and he really appreciated that moving from homeopath to researcher was an entirely different field. And he had loads to learn and loads to develop. And he's, he's been working on that skill ever since 2013. So well done to, to Jeremy as well. So quite a different experience. Um, very intense program. But. People who come seem to love it, and that's why we're on our fourth of this kind. Now, I wanted to just give people a chance. If, you know, you've not thought about coming to London before, but maybe you're intrigued now, um, our early bird discount, which is hefty, it's a big discount, actually ends at midnight tonight. So I did think that's not very reasonable if you, you, know, you want to think it over and think, oh, actually, maybe it is worth visiting. Um, so... There is a code which is only available to people who have attended this webinar. And I was trying to think what the best word was, the code word. And I thought, considering we're having our gala at the Tower of London, and considering the fact that what you won't know yet, we're about to launch it next week, is that our big fundraising drive for this event is going to be an auction for a special private tour of the Crown Jewels. So most gala attendees, you get a walking tour of the Tower of London with a yeoman, you get a drinks reception in the White Tower, you get a full seated proper gala black tie dinner in the Tower of London. But what you don't get is you don't get to see the Crown Jewels because the Crown Jewels is in a small jewel house, if anybody remembers going as a tourist. And we cannot take 240 people to see the Crown Jewels. We can only take 40 for zero. So what we're doing is we're going to launch a fundraising auction very soon on our website and the top 40 
bids that we get to go to on that tour will get to see the crown jewels. So that's why I came up with the code. The code, if you want to get a reduced price ticket at the early bird rate for the conference, is bling. And if you email Simon at events at HRI dash research dot org, giving you two weeks. If you email him with the code bling, then um, you can come to London for the early bird rate. So I hope, um, sorry, I know I speak fast. It's a bad habit of mine. I can't help it. I do try to slow down, but I hope that gave you a little bit of an idea of what HRI is all about. And uh, maybe we have some questions. Yes, we do have some questions, Rachel. Um, I just have a quick mention. Um, Dr. Luke DeShepper um, will donate 10% of all of his e-learning courses to HRI. I just got word of that. So I'm putting um, his home, it's www.homeocourses.com and he will donate 10% of all of that to HRI. Thank you, Dr. Luke. Thank you. Wow, amazing. That's amazing. Thank yeah, you so much. Of course. And okay, I'm not gonna cry. I won't cry. <laughs> no, it's great. And and yeah, when you feel support, it really does make a difference. Really, really. Yeah, yeah. Thank you so much for uh, presenting everything. Um, so one of the questions we have is, um, we 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 have a lot of questions, so I'm I'm getting them all in order. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so in a country like India, where homeopathy is practiced extensively, and most homeopaths um, have access to wide useful data, um, can a standardized can a standardized protocol be developed for homeopaths to document their cases? There is another question as well, where. Um, a homeopath is interested in having his own research, like with multiple sclerosis, what can homeopaths do if they want to document their own cases and kind of do their own research? Okay, cool. So yes, two sort of different but linked questions. Mm -hmm. So in India, you're right, that the, the big frustration a lot of people are feeling is that it's like India is an untapped resource for research in a way. Yes, they have lots of research that's done, but sometimes it, it isn't quite done in a way that enables it to be accepted at an international level. So one of the reasons that I went there um, just over a year ago, and they've also had people like Lex Rutten, uh, Robert Van Haslen, some other research experts visiting India, was to address that very point. So we were hosted by their researchers, and we, we're getting together to try to see how we can bridge that gap. And it's really exciting to see. I can see changes already. So one of those relates directly to that question, which is um, how we can get this huge volume of cases in India to be documented at a sufficiently high scientific level to count, basically, as data. And I was really encouraged to go into a hospital there where I saw them doing MyMOP. Now, some of you will know what MyMOP is. In fact, it was MyMOP 2, which is a newer version of MyMOP. So what this is, is what's called a PROM, which is a patient, record, patient reported outcome measure. So it's basically a sort of questionnaire that patients can fill out. And from that, you get enough data to track the outcome of their treatment. Did they get better or not? Very basic stuff and not difficult to do, but it needs to be done correctly. And Raj Manchanda, who hosted me, was really proud to show me, here we are, we are introducing MyMOP into clinics in hospitals in India using this specific outcome measure that is recognized around the world. So it is beginning. So that's really exciting. Um, and we've also been sort of working on ways that sometimes it's as simple as a language barrier. They'll do a piece of research and it's not well received outside India because the wording is a little strange. It's just not how scientists elsewhere would express it. So we discussed that. And I saw a piece of research come out a few months ago, but not say which one, and I was incredibly excited because like, now that is spot on. That to any scientist in the world sounds right, looks right, it's positive, it's robust. And I texted Raj and said, uh, what's this? And he just sent me loads of smiley faces on WhatsApp <laughs> and said, we heard you, you know, we're doing it. Now that kind of thing is small but huge at the same time, you know, and that study is going to be presented um, at London. So 
we're making big strides there. In terms of an individual homeopath wanting to get in on this, which is great, um, I would point them to a website called Making Cases Count, MCC, Making Cases Count. And that's an initiative that was set up by Dr. Claire Relton, who's actually the keynote speaker in London and was one of the first people involved at HRI, because that was really her um, area of interest. She was very interested in getting grassroots homeopaths into research. So she set up that website exactly for that purpose. So that's got information about how to do it, how to use MyMop with your patients, how to start doing data collection in a way that works. The only thing I would say, though, you had the question about MS. I mean, MS would be a fab, really exciting area to look at. Um, the reason that, uh, was that I say one shift we made at HRI, in the early days, we tried to help what I might call ordinary homeopaths to get into research, to do research. And we did a lot of hand-holding, if you like, trying to sort of help them get going. And we realized that doesn't work. Because at the end of the day, research is a skill in its own right. So I think if you want to research something properly, quite serious, like MS, really you have to commit and at least do a master's, part-time MS, uh, MS. <laughs> part MSc, mm -hmm. get the research skills under your belt, and then apply it to your work. So I feel like we can't have people dabbling in research in that way who aren't trained in research skills. Okay. But my Everybody can do. <laughs> okay, great, great. That's a really good resource. Um, we have another question, kind of shifting gears. Um, Doug is asking, can you say a little bit about Dr. Tournier's research? Um, specifically, what can we now say about the physics of consciousness and its connection to water? Um, can water hold consciousness? kind of like in the sense of Dr. Omoto, how his book um, kind of went through that. Can you speak a little bit about that? I would really like to channel Alex <laughs> um, because uh, this is where I, I'm always very careful because I'm not a physicist. So um, I'm going to try and be accurate um, and not say something that he'll go, no, Rachel, that's all wrong. So the bottom line is um, what do we know so far? What we know or we think we know and Alex is now trying to confirm over a five-year project, is that it appears that uh, he, well, it's his theory, okay, there's multiple theories of mechanism of action, okay, at least three that are being looked at worldwide by different scientists. The theory that Alex is focusing on, because he believes this is the, the answer, is quantum coherence domains, QCDs. And these are basically structures within water that are about 100 nanometers across, and they can capture information and they can retain information. That's the key point because we know we need that for homeopathy to work. So these structures, when you're making a homeopathic remedy, it appears that when you do the succussion, that is when the information about the source material, whether it's pulsatilla or nux or what have you, gets locked in to the water and information gets transferred into the water. Now, nobody wants to use the phrase memory of water. It's not a memory. It's information that's trapped in these tiny, tiny structures in the water, and they survive dilution. That's the crucial point. It's how it can operate beyond Avogadro's number at these very high dilutions. These QCDs are retained by the water, even at high dilutions. We also seem to know from the results so far that that information is in the form of an electromagnetic signal. So this is why there's no chemicals there anymore, there's no molecules anymore of the original substance, but we do have an electromagnetic signal that remains. And that appears to be what is acting in the human body. That appears to be what can be dropped on a pill and stay on a pill and then can work when you take that pill into your mouth. So there are sort of certain things we know so far. And the five-year research program he's designed is to test all of those things we believe we know from these preliminary findings. You know what it's like with research, you have a few good results, but you need to hammer them home. You know, you need to repeat, 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 and find out more. So that's what he's looking at. Now, in terms of understanding that more fully, in a way that is explained by an expert physicist, not by a biologist, um, Alex, I'm very excited, Alex has finally written up this theory. He's been wanting to do it for years, and he's just not had the time. He has written it up as a chapter of a book that is due to come out 
fairly soon and we are hoping it's going to come out in time for London if so it will the book will be at London if not it's going to be around that time and the other work he's done to take us a step forward is he's been working very closely with Stefan Baumgartner who is probably the world authority on basic and fundamental research he's been working in this area for 20 years uh, you might know him from doing plant experiments um, he's been working with Stefan for I think it's two years on a systematic review of every experiment done on the mechanism of action fundamental research on homeopathy that exists it's taken them two years they published the first part a while ago and the second part uh, they're just I think he said he's finalizing some data for it this week actually so it's about to be submitted so that will be published very soon so that means that within a few months you will have the leading systematic review on the topic in the world coming out with every experiment summarized and then you'll have his theory also published so we're very close to it being in a form that people can use and refer to and read through in detail um, so it's explained properly i know it doesn't answer whether water can hold consciousness because that really is beyond my training <laughs> but yeah. some that kind of question if you read alex's systematic review and you read his theory chapter, then between them, it will probably answer that for you. Okay, and then, um, do you know the name of his book? Um, and then someone is wanting to pre-order it, if they are, uh, if it's available. I don't know, which is really funny. I haven't bothered to find out. Really, so we're not organizing that. He was asked to submit that chapter to somebody okay. else. And I feel like I don't want to say anything in case I'm not meant to. Um, okay. You can be sure that the moment I'm allowed to say that, I'll check after the, this webinar, and if we're allowed to say, then I can let you know, obviously. Um, you can, but of course, as soon as it's available, we'll make sure it's, it's on our website and people know about it. Okay, great. Yeah, and, and I'm sure we can send out an email as well to everybody that attended this webinar and let them know um, when, that, when that book is available. Um, kind of going off the idea, and someone had the question, um, QCD, that was quantum coherence domains. Correct. Um, well <laughs> kind of going, I know, kind of going off that question, um, is there, um, somebody had the question, nanoparticles are gaining popularity in many fields, including conventional medicine. Um, is homeopathy gaining any ground and being accepted by conventional science as a result of using nanoparticles? Um, I can't speak to what conventional medics think of that because, um, you know, I haven't spoken to them specifically about that. Certainly, I would say in our field, it's more that way around. Homeopaths love the fact they can see a sort of resonance, you know. We feel like, oh, that sounds very like homeopathy. And I would say there's a lot of truth in that, which is another reason I'm very optimistic because I've been involved in the research side since about 2008. And what I've observed is that, conventional science is getting closer and closer to what we know from homeopathy and at the same time the homeopathy research is getting better and better we don't have enough we don't have enough funding it's too slow but what we're doing is very good all the people doing it they're doing good research now they know what they're doing so we're kind of coming together i feel like we're coming from opposite ends towards the same point and again this is more alex's thing but he's had certainly um um real breakthrough with one of his colleagues from cancer research actually because can you imagine being there he actually wasn't allowed to talk about homeopathy we weren't allowed to say on the hri website that he worked at cancer research we were gagged until he left we couldn't say that so it's that level of conflict and his colleagues there thought he was nuts even though they respected his mainstream work they said on this alex you're nuts now alex told me that about a year and a half ago a research paper came out in chemistry, conventional chemistry, and it was talking about the influence um, on ions, the influence ions have at a certain distance with molecules around them. And I can't remember the details. It's on a slide somewhere. But basically, they had got it wrong in the conventional science world by an order of millions. You know, the magnitudes were so far wrong. And this colleague of Alex's picked up this paper and said to Alex, if this is right, I'm going to have to rethink homeopathy because I think you're right. No, it's one of these steps, and that's pure chemistry. So to me, yes, I've got the details on file, but the details aren't important. It's about the fact that they are finding out new things every day in conventional science, and all of them that I've seen are heading the same way to where we know 
it, what's going on. It all ties in with homeopathy. So I'm very, very encouraged by that for sure. Okay. Yeah, that's very encouraging to hear. I just realized the specific nano, I wasn't dodging it, the nanoparticles thing. Yeah, it's um, personally, I'm not a big fan of the nanoparticle theory, so I have to declare that. What I think, and I've spoken directly to John Ives about this, to Iris Bell about this, to Professor Valare when I visited his lab. So we all discuss this as scientists together, our differences. You know, it's very healthy. And what I've said most recently to John Ives about this is I believe nanoparticles play a role at the lower dilutions, below Avogadro's number. I think they must do, especially when you're getting towards the 12C area around there where we've got some particles left but hardly any nanoparticles probably do play a role and at that point you've probably also got the qc well you will have the qcds as well but once you go beyond avogadro i don't personally see how the nanoparticles can be doing it but i believe that's when the qcds take over that's what i mean so i feel like they're not opposing theories they are two theories that may just be relevant to a greater or lesser extent depending on which potency we're talking about um, and the reason that i'm kind of unsure about the nano nanoparticles is that um, for some of the research i've looked at i'm concerned about the lack of controls you know some of the experiments don't have the controls we would expect to see um, so yeah there's some some holes in the research which i think researchers are now trying, trying to look at um, but certainly um, there's been one or two papers and books that we've been sent by colleagues saying, oh, HRI needs to see this. They've shown, they've proven nanoparticles are present at 200C or whatever. And when we've looked at that research, it doesn't stand up, sadly, uh, not to the standards we would need internationally. So that's why I have hesitations about it. Okay, okay. Um, and then another question, Rachel. Um, the, the true power of homeopathy is an in individualized prescribing, you know, taking into account the whole person and individually prescribing rather than kind of Western medicine that, you know, has a drug for asthma. We don't have that in homeopathy. Um, is there any progress on gaining acceptance for this unique prescription model kind of via the standard conventional research model? So do you mean in terms of people liking the fact homeopathy is individualized, or do you mean in the fact of can you do research on an individualized medicine? Are you more about the research? I believe can you do medi can you do the research on kind of an individualized model? It's a whole different model than the conventional research model. That's a really good question because it's probably one of the biggest myths around homeopathy research. Years ago, we had people saying you cannot research homeopathy using the traditional RCT model, you know, randomized controlled trials, because of all the things we know are different by homeopathy. That actually isn't true. Um, what's happened is over the years, um, homeopathy researchers have looked at that question and they've found solutions. So, for example, you'll find it on our website. If you just Google depression, you'll find this brilliant study by Emma Macias Cortez in Mexico. It was presented, there's a film of her presenting it in Malta at our conference. And she looked at depression associated with menopause. And she did a traditional RCT with three groups. We had the placebo group. We had a group who took fluoxetine or Prozac. And then we had the group that had proper homeopathy individualized and treated for six weeks or so. But everything about it was a traditional standard research protocol. And that came out positively. Prozac did do better than placebo. Homeopathy did better than both the Prozac and the placebo. It was the best treatment in that trial. And what's interesting is it shows how far homeopathy research has come because what she did was she used two outcome measures. You know, I spoke earlier about patient reported outcome measures. There are basically, again, standardized ways that conventional researchers use to check whether somebody gets better or not during a trial. And one of them is the um, green scale that you use to check menopause symptoms so emma used that with her patients and she found that not only did her patients get better from depression which was obviously the point of the trial she found out that her patients being given the homeopathy their menopausal symptoms got better as well and she did it she showed that using a conventional technique that any scientist would recognize as genuine so she used these two outcome measures one for depression one for menopause 
And that means that any scientist who knows nothing about homeopathy has to recognize that homeopathy worked there. And what I love about that study is that it shows you the beauty of homeopathy because, of course, the placebo group, they didn't get that better. The Prozac group, their depression got better, but their menopause was the same. You'd expect that. The homeopathy group, the depression and the menopause got better because we know it's holistic. So there you have an RCT proving not only that homeopathy is effective, that it's not placebo, and that it's holistic. It can deal with two problems at the same time. Now, to me, that's about as good as it gets. So, yeah, you can research it and you can cope with the individualization. The only thing that I need to say to a sort of caveat, as Robert Matthew always said, the caveat is always a glitch, is it is true that that traditional placebo-controlled trial is not the optimum way to capture the full effects of homeopathy, okay? What you're doing by doing a placebo control and doing it well is that you are only measuring the effect of the pill itself. So you're deliberately cancelling out the effect of the practitioner directions, the lifestyle advice, everything we do with our patients, you know, that is very valuable and transformative sometimes. So you are not capturing the full impact of that treatment. You are only capturing the pill itself. So it's important that people understand that. If you want to capture the whole effect, you have to do a different kind of study. And that's like the depression one and the ADHD one HRI funded that's why we do pragmatic trials, because then you get all of the effects. You get the pill and the practitioner and the interaction, you know, but different trials for different questions. OK, great. That's really good to know. Um, and then, Rachel, you said there was three mechanistic theories being tested, um, one being the quantum coherence theory, the QCD, um, the nanoparticle theory. And what's the third one? The third one, um, you could either say it's the silica hypothesis, which is linked to nanoparticles. So uh, John Ives initiated that one, that there's an interaction between the silica and the glassware and the remedy during succussion that creates these kind of silica-based nanoparticles. So that's a sort of, that's linked to the nanoparticles. So somebody might consider those together, others consider them separate. When I say three, I'm actually referring to nanobubbles. So there's a theory that nanobubbles are created in a layer at the top of the test tube during succussion, if you like, and that when you put the pipette in, you capture those nanobubbles and you put them into the next test tube when you're making the remedy, when you're doing the serial dilution, and it's the nanobubbles that are capturing information, and that's how it survives dilution. So I'd say they're probably the top three to four, depending on where you segregate them off. Okay, perfect. And, and Rachel, what was the... Um the researcher's name that did the um, RCT study from Mexico that you just talked about? Macias Cortez. So that's M-A-C-I-A-S dash Cortez, C-O-R-T-E-S. Perfect. Thank you so much. She's a lovely, lovely woman. She's great. So I think this clip, you'll see clips of her on our website as well, talking about her research. Perfect. Great. Um, and then um, we had another question. Um, are you aware of the research done with polarity analysis? Um, public prescribing. Yeah, yes. Yeah. Um, this person um, uses polarity analysis in his practice and um, says that it's one of the most research researchable formats and the efficacy looks to be very high. Um, do you have an opinion about doing increasing polarity analysis research clinical studies? That's so interesting because that's my dream. My dream is that we get to the point we're not just asking, is it better than placebo? You know, is it efficacious? If it, is it effective? All these, you know, jargony words. We're doing the research that homeopaths want to know. Now, I, I know homeopaths want to know how well it works in different medical conditions, I would say because that's really useful for patients. Patients don't come saying, I'm a totality. They come saying, I've got psoriasis or eczema or arthritis, you know? So that condition-based research is very useful for homeopaths and for patients and decision makers. But one day, when we can stop banging that particular drum, I remember saying years ago, you know what I want to do? <laughs> I want to get all these different types of homeopathy and test them for the same condition. How much fun would that be? You're a sensation prescriber, game on. You're saying no, it should be keynotes, game on. <laughs> you know, and why not polarity? Why not Shulton method? Why not, you know, 
all these things that we all feel strongly about what we feel you know is the right way and the wrong way other people are more sort of liberal and do multiple different techniques but how great would it be to start doing that now step one which we're already trying to do it's baby steps uh, claire relton really started this work several years ago uh, she caught, did an article called untangling the debate she was the one that started being vocal in the scientific forums about the fact that back then people didn't even differentiate in research between individualized and non-individualized homeopathy you know they just called it homeopathy they certainly didn't say was it isopathic or not they didn't say whether it was delivered by a trained homeopath or not you know all these basics let alone methodology so we've made some quite big strides because even in the australian report <laughs> they actually separated individualized and non-individualized in one chapter it's a start <laughs> for childhood diarrhea they separated jennifer jacobs work into the three studies on individualized and the one study on a complex now that's the start uh, so we're really pushing for all research that's done now to be incredibly specific about what you did the potency the technique was it a practitioner was it over the counter etc and then one day we can start getting into the different methodologies that will be fun, be fun. you know because there's because homeopaths have so many different methodologies <laughs> absolutely absolutely okay um we have a couple more questions. Um, are homeopathy researchers making progress in overcoming the cherry-picking accusation by registering and reporting all studies regardless of the outcome? Are we gaining headway in that? A little bit. I mean, it's interesting that, of course, that whole movement was really about pharmaceutical companies having fooled us for decades and cheated, basically, by only publishing their final results after maybe 10 years looking at a drug you just published the positive trial at the end you know only publishing positive studies so that initiative that you now have to register every trial before you start so the world knows you're doing it and you can't cherry pick you, you can't decide which ones to publish and which ones not came from the pharmaceutical industry came from conventional science now i think it's helping in the sense that people can't say we're hiding anything but to be honest i don't think the homeopathy research sector was ever really doing that the number of studies we do is so small relatively convert with conventional medicine i think most studies were published to be honest um, it wasn't really a problem in our backyard it was a problem in the conventional medicine backyard really um, but certainly at least now that everybody has to register every trial regardless of the topic they certainly can't accuse us of that i would say though the place where we get accused of cherry picking isn't there they say we cherry pick when we communicate about the research. So they would say, for example, Rachel, you shouldn't only talk about Emma Macias Cortez depression study, because what about all the other studies on depression? So that's where you can be accused of cherry picking is you should present all the data on a given topic. Now on the HRI website, you'll see a section called essential evidence. Now that is a little bit different from the FAQs. There's some overlap, but the whole tone is, it's not defensive, it's not arguing, it's just presenting what I believe is the essential evidence, meaning this is the most important studies, and this is why. But it is not every study on homeopathy, of course. But I then put a thing, there's probably a picture of cherries, knowing me, <laughs> a bit about cherry picking, saying this is not cherry picking, because that is every study on E. coli being used in piglets, because there's only one. So that is not cherry picking, you know, that is the best study on this. And I'm also going to tell you about the other ones. You know, we are not cherry picking. We're just pulling out the highest quality. And also you have to be aware if someone says uh, you're cherry picking, that would only be true if there was another study on the same treatment with the same outcome you're testing. It has to be the same study. So when someone says to me, oh, you're cherry picking because you talk about maybe three or four different very good quality studies that show homeopathy works, you don't mention a completely different one that was negative. Well, you wouldn't in normal science. So people need to understand that the cherry-picking argument only deals with the same study being done six times, and if it only worked one time, you have to say so. That's what cherry-picking is all about. So it does not apply to different studies on different treatments and different types of homeopathy. It's nonsense. Okay, okay. Good to know. 
Um, and then we have a question going back to the Australian report. Um, do we know who was kind of behind the Australian's government's fraudulent efforts to badmouth homeopathy in the first place? Do we have an idea of that? We do. Um, obviously, this is a legal case, and we're not quite at the finishing line yet. But uh, can you imagine, Jerry has looked at pretty much every email and every meeting minutes for years that went on around that time. So, yeah, you can start to see who the key players were in terms of decisions that were made, let's put it that way. Um, so we know named individuals who appeared to steer a committee in a certain direction or we know exactly who decided on that particular rule or so on. So, yes, we have an awful lot of data that we have not been able to talk about publicly and we won't be able to until the case is finished. Um, but it's going to be really interesting to see to see what the outcome is. And then, of course, the most recent call we had with the lawyer, well, the last few actually in, in the last six weeks or so, have all been about preparing for the verdict and checking with her about, okay, we've behaved so well for three years because we did not want to jeopardize this case, but we are sitting on all this information. Can you imagine what we know that we can't say? So we've been going through with the lawyer saying, what are we going to be allowed to say once the verdict is in, whether it's positive or negative? And I was quite excited because we can say a lot. <laughs> once that verdict is in, we can open the doors on a lot of information that um, HRI has been having to be incredibly discreet about. Okay, perfect. Um, and then uh, we have one more question here, Rachel. Um, will there be a live webinar streaming for the upcoming conference? We don't do live streaming. Uh, we've thought about it a few times because what we focus on is we want the best quality for longevity. So we are literally flying our um, director who does all our films. His day job, he's in New Zealand, his day job is he does, um, I'm a celebrity, get me out of there from the jungle, you know, the jungle thing. And he does Coast Australia. So he's that level of editor. And he comes on site and he oversees all the filming so that all of our presentations are done so well, even with showing you the PowerPoint and the speaker at exactly the right moment. So you, it's as if you're there. And then we make them live forever afterwards. So we sort of focus on that and getting that top quality rather than risking the whole live attendance thing. Perfect. Perfect. Um, and then, um, and, and thank you so, so much, Rachel. This was, this was so great, um, you know, to learn and see how we can help this upcoming conference, the latest, you know, research, you know, I, I don't like to think of us as the underdogs right now, but, but we are coming together in collaboration and that is so important. So thank you for all you do. Oh, you work so fun. hard at this, at this, um, and it's really appreciated by all the homeopaths everywhere. Thanks so much, Anna. It's a real yeah. pleasure. And thank you for your Sunday time, which is... Of course, of course. Thank you. Um, and then at, someone is asking, the conference will be available, yes, after. And I would look on the HRI website, Paulette, to see when the conference will be available. Absolutely, because it does, when are we mid-June, so it's usually in the autumn, so that by the time we have all the films up, because it's about 36 of the films that have to be put together, so. That is perfect. Okay. Thank well, you thank so you much. all. And thank you for joining. Enjoy the rest of your Sunday. Thank you again, Rachel. Thank you, Marco. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Okay. We will see you all next time. Bye-bye. Okay. Bye.